Good morning. Thank you for joining me for Sunday School this week. We are on Lesson 12. If you have your Sunday School book, we are on Lesson 12, The Problem of Evil and Suffering. And we're in a unit that is about defending our faith. And, you know, one of the most common questions and probably the most difficult questions as Christians that we face is the question of where is God when there's evil and suffering? Or people will ask, why does God allow evil and suffering? So today in lesson 12, that's one of the, the hard topics that we're going to dive into and try to look at some biblical answers to that question. The central truth of this lesson says, despite evil and suffering, God is good. And you know, one thing we can all agree on and say for certain is that every one of us can see evil and suffering around us right now. Um, if you look at a news headline, if you turn on the news, um, you will see evil in our world. There's a lot of evil. If you are just alive in the day that we live in, I'm sure that you know someone who is suffering from loss or you have suffered loss. It is just so um, very relevant right now in our society as we're going through um, a difficult pandemic. There are so many people dealing with suffering and loss even right now. So I hope today's lesson will encourage you and answer some of those questions that you might have about that. You know, many people can get angry or confused when they can't figure out what's going on or what God is doing, when they have questions about why things are happening in their life. And, you know, as our human nature, we try to attempt to understand everything or to find a reason for everything. Um, and, and that causes us sometimes to question the goodness of God. And then sometimes as Christians, when we are trying to comfort others, some of the statements we might make um, can cause a little bit more of that questioning among people. You know, we'll often say to someone who has experienced a loss, we'll say, God has a plan. Well, that, you know, that's very true that God has a plan and he is sovereign. But part of God's sovereign plan involves the free will of men and women. And, you know, that's something we always need to remember is that while God is in control, while God is sovereign, while God does have a plan, he also allows for the free will of men and we each have choices to make. So sometimes the things that we face, oftentimes the things that we face are a result of that free will of man in our society, that they've made choices outside of God's will. Um, another common thing you'll hear people say during difficult times, they'll tell someone, well, God won't put more on you than you can bear. And you know, that that is actually a, a misquoting of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 because what that scripture actually says is God will not allow you to be tempted above that ye are able and it goes on to say but he will also make a way of escape or he will enable you to overcome that temptation so you know we can't think that God won't put more on you than you can bear as if because you're strong he's going to put more on you and you're going to suffer more no, that scripture was saying he won't allow you to be tempted above what you can find a way of escape from. You know, the fact is, I think most of us would agree, everyday life, life itself living in the day we live in can be more than I can bear. It can be more than you can bear. So what we should say is God won't give you more than you can bear on your own because truthfully, I can't bear anything on my own, but he will be with you and he will help you bear it. See, God never intended us to bear anything alone, but we are to, to be yoked up with Jesus Christ and he bears those things with us. So what I would like to say this morning as we get into the lesson is if life feels like right now more than you can bear, just be encouraged that you don't have to bear it alone. Jesus is beside you. He will be the one that stands with you and puts his arm around you and helps you to carry that heavy load. That's the comfort we have is that we don't have to bear anything alone. The first point in this lesson that we want to look at is when we look at sin and evil and suffering, where did it originate from? Well, we have to go all the way back to the garden for that. So the first point is sin brought dysfunction. And this goes back to Genesis chapter 1 
And there's um, several scriptures we'll skip around in this morning. But I'm going to read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. It says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. In the story of the garden, when God begins, or in, in Genesis chapter 1, when God begins creating, you will see all through chapter 1, and I encourage you to look back, but all through chapter 1, when God would create, it was good. And then he would create something else, and he would say, it was good. But at the end of day 6, as we just read here, when God had created man and animals and land, God looks at his total creation, and he says, it was very good. You know, God made a perfect creation. God set up a, a world um, that was in perfect order, that everything worked the way that it should. It was a, a glorious, a beautiful creation. You know, you would, most of us would agree that the, the God's creation, just going out in the woods is such a peaceful thing. You know, seeing the waves crashing at the beach, looking at mountains, you know, looking across a desert or the plains, uh, what a beautiful creation God made. And you know, because that was a platform of God's glory, it was a showcase of God's glory when you see his creation. And, and I believe that's why still for many of us, we find peace in God's nature and God's creation. You know, um, some of the world gets it wrong. They'll, they'll worship nature itself or, or, you know, give their adoration and their love to nature because it's such a beautiful thing. But they have failed to realize in that, that there is a glorious creator who made this creation. So God's creation was very good. It was set in order. It was a perfect environment for living things to thrive in, such as, you know, as animals and humans. And God rested on that seven day because he had prepared a place that was in a perfect rhythm. It, the sun going up, the sun going down, the tides coming in, the tides going out. God had a perfect environment and a place for mankind to live, and it was very good. So we see that God set things up to work perfectly. Um, most of us know the story, though, as we go down to Genesis chapter 3. It's only two short chapters later that there is an interruption to God's divine order and God's divine creation. Um, and we're going to talk about how sin corrupted or disrupted God's divine creation. So now let's look in Genesis chapter 3. And I'm just going to read verses 3 through 5. Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the serpent here begins to beguile Eve, and most of us are familiar with this story. God had told Adam and Eve they could eat of every tree in that garden except for one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And from beginning, God set um, the rules for life in his kingdom. He set um, Adam and Eve in a perfect environment, but he gave them an order and a direction. And tragically, as we know the story, they disobey God. You know, the serpent he begins to distort God's word, and he begins to try to make Eve question God's word. Did God say? And, and we know how he tries to make it sound like God is, is just holding back from Adam and Eve, that he just doesn't want them to know something in the fullness. And, you know, the, Satan is still using that same trick. He is still trying to beguile us and twist the words of God to look like God is just trying to keep us from something. And, you know, what a trickery the serpent painted this picture for Eve. And when Eve fell for this sin and this temptation, we know the story. She ate the fruit. Adam ate of the fruit. Both of them at that point sinned. And why was it a big deal? Because they went against the command and the direction of God. They went against the divine order that God had put in place. By that one simple decision of disobeying God and eating fruit, they chose to govern themselves other than let God govern them. They chose that, that their desire was more important 
than God's will and God's direction. And that's what made that such a sin. Um, and that from this point on, we know there's been um, the fallout and that sin entered the world and is now rippled down through the ages till we still deal with sin to this day because of that decision by Adam and Eve. You know, this is the original sin of humankind. It's a desire to live by your own rules. And, you know, we still, like I said, we still battle that in our generation. That is why many people don't serve God. They desire to live by their own rules rather than the words and the rules of God. So Adam and Eve distorted the perfect relationship that God had set up. They no longer knew God just in his love but they also had to experience God's judgment and thus they were afraid of him. And we know the story, how they hid. Um, and because they no longer had that, just that love and fellowship with God, but they had to face his judgment for their sin. And so, you know, we know that the curse because of sin brought about man had to labor to get food. And then women had to now labor in childbirth because of this sin that Adam and Eve committed. You know, the, the second point of this that we're going to get into is how human nature is corrupted. Because of this decision by Adam and Eve to sin and disobey God, human nature from this point on dealt with the corruption of sin. So we're going to look at Psalms now. I want to read Psalms chapter 51 verse 5. And here we see where in the Psalm he says, Behold, I was shapen or formed in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Now this may have been specifically David speaking in this psalm, but this is true for us today. We are born in sin did, did, were we conceived, and in iniquity are we shapen. Basically saying we're all born into sin. Um, because of the fallout of Adam and Eve, every one of us is born in a sinful nature, and it is just our sinful nature from the, from the time we can even begin to act and think to act in sin and rebellion against God. Isaiah 64, 6, we're going to read that. Isaiah 64, 6 through 7 describes it as well. He said, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. So here in Isaiah, he's also sharing how, as humans, that we are, we are just unclean. Our righteousness, even in ourselves, is just as filthy rags. We can't be clean on our own. We all fade as a leaf. We all deal with iniquity. And so the Bible leaves no doubt here about the condition of humankind as a result of the fall. You know, even back where I just read in Psalms 51 and 5, David's declaring his sinfulness. But I love that if you go on down and you read further after verse 5 and verse 7 and verse 10, David begins to cry and pray. He doesn't just stay in that condition of, you know, Lord, I am, I am shaping in iniquity and I'm conceived in sin. But he recognizes that he can be delivered from that. In verse 7, he cries out and says for the Lord to purge me, purge me and cleanse me. And then in verse 10, he asks, he says, create in me a new heart. So we see here what we all deal with is being born in sin, being shaped in iniquity. But as David, we must cry out for God to purge us from sin. We must cry out for God to create in us a new heart. And we know this comes through salvation by Jesus Christ and being purged from our sin. Um, Isaiah shared the, the same thing. Is You know, the, the greatest problem we deal with in our society is that, that people don't want to admit what I just read to you, that they're sinners. And, you know, the church world has contributed to this. And when I say church world, I mean some churches. Um, they've taken away the preaching of sin. And when people walk in a church, uh, when people encounter a Christian, they should feel convicted of their sins. They should be come to that knowledge that they have sinned. Because you see the problem with if a sinner comes into a church, and they're never made to understand that they were born in sin, that they are full of iniquity. 
then they never see a need for salvation. And if you never see a need for salvation, then have you been saved from anything? But by acknowledging as David and Isaiah that I am a sinner and that I have sinned, I also understand that I need salvation, that I need a new heart created within me. So you see, it's not a, a judgmental thing to let a sinner know that they need Christ, that they have sin in their life. It's not um, a hateful thing. It's a, it's a basic thing that all men need to understand is that without Jesus Christ, we are a sinner and that we are full of evil and iniquity. And so we can't take that away when we deal with people because then we take away their need and their hope for salvation. You see even in the New Testament where Jesus, when he encountered the woman at the well, he didn't tell her how wonderful she was. He didn't tell her that her sin was okay. He brought her sin to the forefront. In their discussion, he brought it out and he said, he, he said, go get your husband. Because he knew that she, did, that she was a woman of sin and that had had many husbands and that was now living in sin and iniquity. He brought that out because he did love her. And he wanted her to acknowledge her sin so that she could be saved from her sin. And we know that story, that the love Jesus shows her and how she begins to confess her wrongdoings to him, how she begins to accept Jesus Christ, and how she brings a whole town to also know Jesus Christ. So it's important that we all acknowledge that we were born into sin, but that we can be reborn in a second birth through Jesus Christ. So why, why do we bring all this up? It's important we understand there is evil in this world because Adam and Eve introduced it. Evil came through sin, and we each are born into that same nature, and because of that, sin is prevalent in our society. Um, I want to read one more scripture on that. In Mark chapter 7, verse 23, Jesus said it like this. He said, all these evil things come from within and defile the men, the men or the man. So all these evil things that we're born into, this evil nature, it comes from within us in our very nature, and that is what defiles us until we get rid of that sin in our life. But thankfully, there was an answer for that. Jesus offers lasting hope. I'm going to read Romans chapter 5 and verse 19 through 21, and I want you to listen to what this says. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And this is talking about Adam. Because of this one man's sin, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, that's talking about Jesus now, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So in a world where sin is abounding, evil was all around, when Jesus died for our sins, his grace did much more abound. His grace was so great that it covered all the sin and evil of mankind that started in that garden. And then now let's bring that verse to ourselves in our present time. Sin abounds. Sin is everywhere. Evil is everywhere. Suffering is everywhere. But, but the grace of Jesus Christ does much more abound where sin does abound. We have the promise that we have the grace of Jesus Christ where sin is abounding. We have the grace of, of Jesus that does abound even more. So Jesus gave us hope in a world where sin is everywhere, where sin is abounding, that the grace of Jesus Christ is much greater than that. So the next point we want to look at is in a world where things just sometimes don't seem fair, where same things just don't seem to be right, um, it's hard to understand. Triumph of God's justice, and that's our next point. There is a triumph of God's justice. We're going to look at Romans chapter 8, verse 18, that there's hope in the middle of suffering. You know, I can't promise you today that you won't deal with suffering, that you won't deal with something worse tomorrow than what you deal with today. But I can, through Scripture, remind you that we do have hope in the middle of suffering. And this verse from Romans chapter 8 and verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And then in verse 28, he says, And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, I want to talk about these two scriptures. You know, um, we, we, as a Western culture church, as an American church, we've really done a, a misservice to a lot of American people. We tend to think that as Christians, we shouldn't deal with suffering. Um, and, and you know, we read a, I read to you earlier the scripture where God allows the sun to rise on the, the evil and on the good. God allows the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. There is suffering in this world since Adam and Eve sinned. There, there's pain, there's, there's sickness, there's cancer, there's diseases. Um, and, and of course, we know that, that all of us are going to deal with ultimately that, that that's appointed to man wants to die. So we're all going to, to face death in, in, in our family and our friends. Our, we all have an appointed time. And we sometimes mistake that these things are some kind of um, situation that as Christians we don't face. So then when we face it, we get upset and, and many people get angry with God and question God. You know, Job set the perfect example of this. When he lost everything, everything he had and his children through death. You don't see Job say, why did God allow this to happen to me when I've served God and been faithful to him? No, you see Job, he just bows down and he begins to worship God. And he says, you know, the Lord has given and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job had such an understanding and an internal vision. And these verses remind us in Romans it didn't tell us that we wouldn't suffer. What he's reminding us in Romans is the sufferings that we go through are one day going to be nothing compared to the glory that we will have in heaven. You know, the only true comfort we can give one another, I can't promise you that your life down here is going to be peaceful. I can't promise you that you won't suffer. If I can't promise the church in Afghanistan that they're not going to deal with persecution and suffering, how can I promise you that you won't deal with persecution and suffering? You know, as Brother Lance says all the time, the gospel that we preach in America should be able to be preached in the Sudan. It should be able to be preached in Afghanistan. It should work for the church in Haiti. So I can't say to you that it, that because you're a Christian that everything's going to look good, that God's going to just, just give you a, a peaceful walk, walk in that. You're never going to deal with suffering. I would be lying to say that. But I can tell you that Romans has just told us in this scripture that the suffering we face will be nothing compared to the glory that one day we will face in heaven. That we need to have our eyes on heaven because that is what we are saved from. We're saved from this world of evil and suffering and sin. And we have a promise that one day we will be in heaven. And he says here, we also have this promise that all things work together for the good. You know what that means is that all the things we face and go through, they are going to work together to create a good in our life. And, and you know that second part of the scripture some people forget to quote is to them who are called according to his purpose. When you are called and living according to the purpose of God, you have an assurance that everything you go through, that all the things that happen will work together for your good. Um, you know, unfortunately, the consequences of the fall, the consequences of the sin are still something we deal with today. We deal with the impacts of that. So every everything we face is, is not necessarily because we have sinned, but because of sin. Um, because of the sin in, of Adam and Eve, the world we live in is fallen from God's design. Um, that sin has rippled down through the generations. And, and I would also like to say, you know, sometimes the hardship and the suffering that we deal with is because of someone else. Um, you know, for instance, right now, the, the suffering that many are dealing with around this world is because, you know, they're, of a pandemic, of a, of a disease, of a virus. Well, you know, that this much of this has resulted from mankind and our actions. You know, also, let me say this, we 
live in a, a nation that has turned their back on God. We are sinning every day in this nation. Babies are being aborted. Men are shaking their fist in the face of God and saying, we'll do what we want to do. We will decide for ourselves what gender we want to be. We will decide for ourselves what we think marriage is. We will decide for ourselves how we want to live. And much of that in this nation is outside of the word of God and the will of God. Because of that, our nation is dealing with judgment and wrath of God. So we as Christians, while we may not be part of that sin, we are living in a sinful nation. So understand that we may deal with certain things and suffering as God is judging a sinful nation. Um, I, I remind you, if you think I'm wrong in this and you say, I don't agree with you, I want you to think of Daniel. Daniel lived in a nation that had sinned and rejected God. And because of that, God allowed the nation uh, um, of Israel to be taken and they were taken into Babylonian captivity. Daniel served God. Daniel was a good and a righteous man, but yet he was taken into Babylonian captivity. He suffered with his nation because of their sin. Now we know God granted Daniel favor. Daniel stood for God. Daniel held strong to his faith and God used Daniel. And as we saw in verse uh, 28 in Romans, God worked all these things for Daniel's good. But we know that Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, they faced challenges and suffering because of their nation that had sinned. And, and I want to let you know and comfort you, we may go through things because our nation has turned their back on God. That does not mean God has forsaken us or forgotten us. We have a promise that he'll be with us and, and that he will watch over us and that he will keep us However, we may suffer as our nation suffers in their rebellion against God. And that's just, we see that in scripture time and time again. Many times the, in, in Israel, when they turned their back on God, they suffered as a nation. So sometimes we suffer because of those around us. But so much of it comes back to God allows free choice. God allowed mankind to make choices and many take the wrong path. And you know, um, often things we complain about are things that we made choices, but yet we want to get upset with God. You know, um, I choose where I work. It's my free will, my free choice for, for the most part. I chose where I have my job at. So then how can I complain and get upset with God if, if, my, if things on my job site aren't, aren't going the way I want them to? If I complain and gripe and get upset with God and say, you know, why do I go through this? Well, I chose my job. Um, I would say the same thing about marriages. You know, as a free will human, we choose who we marry. I hope that we prayed and sought God about it. But so many choose who they're going to marry. Later, they suffer because of that, because they go through things. Their spouse may have made bad choices. They may have made bad choices. But I remind you that out of your free will, you chose these things, these marriages, these decisions. So be careful getting angry at God when you go through things. Just understand God will be with you through suffering, but you made many of these choices. Um, you know, the same thing as far as we choose a lot of times where we live, the house we buy, the cars we buy, the financial decisions we make, the church we go to. Um, we make a lot of these decisions as humans. But then when we go through suffering, or I wouldn't even call it suffering, if we go through trials, if we go through hard times, we want to get upset or frustrated with God. And why are you allowing me to suffer? But keep in mind, a lot of these were free will decisions that you made. And did you even seek God for these things? So it's not that God is putting things on you and causing you to suffer. You may be suffering because of your decisions. You may be suffering because of someone else's decisions that you can't control. But the good news is, there's grace for that, and God will be with you through it, no matter what it is that you suffer. Um, so God can uh, redeem our decisions, and God can be with us through our decisions. We're kept by the love of God. And I want to read this scripture to you. It goes right along with what I was, I was just saying. In Romans chapter 8, verse 35, um, and then verse 37. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us? from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Now look at 37. 
Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You know, it, he didn't say in verse 35 that we wouldn't face those things. But he said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And this is a question. He's saying, will tribula tribulation suffer, um, separate you from the love of Christ? No, it won't. Will distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, will that separate you from the love of Christ? No, it will not. Because he said in verse 37, in all these, we're more than conquerors. Notice that he said we will overcome and we can conquer through Jesus Christ. He didn't say we wouldn't go through hunger, famine, persecution, or the sword. He didn't say we wouldn't go through those things. He just simply said, will they separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? No. But through all of those things, we can be more than overcomers because of Jesus Christ. His love will keep us through all of those things. So again, there is scripture after scripture in the Bible. If you read through the New Testament, there are so many scriptures that will show us that we may suffer, but that Jesus Christ will be with us through those sufferings and that he won't leave us alone through those sufferings. In verse um, 36 there, which I didn't read, he even said that, you know, for they are killed all the day long and they are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You know, we have brothers and sisters in Christ around this world in Afghanistan right now who are killed all the day long because of their love for Jesus Christ. But thank God for those scriptures we just read where he said that the suffering that we go through now isn't comparable to the reward that we will receive in heaven. And that is our hope and that is our promise. God is with us at all times, even in our darkest moments. No matter the source or the outcome of the suffering, we have a promise that he will be with us. Um, and, and I want to read now in... Revelations 21, and, and this was one of our, our um, key scripture for this lesson, and I saved it for the end of this lesson because it's so important. The ultimate promise that we have, God will prevail. We will prevail over all. We have a promise. We know how this story ends. Um, Revelations 21, and I'm going to read verses 2 through um, 4. Revelations 21, 2 through 4. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And this verse 4 is our promise. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This scripture is, is letting us know we may have tears in this earth. In your life, you may have dealt with a lot of sorrow. You may deal with a lot of pain, but he made us a promise in verse 4 that God himself will wipe away all tears, that he will wipe away all the, the sorrow, the death, there will be no more death and sorrow in that, that land. He said there will be no more pain for the former things are passed away. This is the promise that we have. This is what we hold on to. This is how we can endure temptation, suffering, trials, um, the evil that is taking place around us when it just overwhelms us sometimes with grief. We can look at that and know that we have a promise that God himself will wipe away our tears and that one day we will deal with this no longer. Um, you know, God is not finished being good. God is not finished being God. And that's the last point of our lesson is, you know, we don't walk through hardships alone. That in the middle of our trials, we can see God's goodness. You know, one place in the Bible refers to the lily in the valley. We may go through valleys, but in, even in the middle of that, God will raise up those beautiful moments, those lilies, those things to just encourage us and give us hope and give us peace. And, you know, you may say, you know, Sister Becky, you didn't really answer the question. So I want to, as I end this lesson, I want to go back and reiterate just a little bit. What is our answer when someone says, well, why, 
Why is there suffering in this world? Well, the, the one answer to that is God never said we wouldn't have suffering. Um, if you've heard that somewhere, someone's misquoted scripture, God is a good God and he does love us. But God gave us free will. And we went back and looked at that where Adam and Eve sinned. And when sin entered, entered this world, you need to put the blame on who it belongs to. Satan brought about sin. Um, through, through sin entering this world, suffering and evil came into this world. And, and that was not God's ultimate plan and will. We see where he created a, a world of, of peace and joy and unity and harmony. But sin brought about death, murdering, suffering, pain, evil, and, and you see God allowed that free will of man. So when we see the things going on, when we see persecution, when we see um, just the terrible evil in our, even in, in America, but around the world, when you see people doing things and you say, how can evil just, how can anyone be so evil? I can't wrap my mind around comprehending the evil understand that, that Satan is evil and these things come from their father which is Satan and, and, and it's because God has allowed mankind to make their free decisions and their free choices and, and many men are choosing evil and you know that doesn't mean God's not involved it doesn't mean that God just stepped back and looked at the world and said I'm just gonna watch them destroy themselves no God is an involved creator and he is there with us and we know that when we cry out to him, when we seek forgiveness of our sins, he washes us away. As, as Jesus told Nicodemus, we're born again. A new heart is in us and we are made into a new creature. So we have deliverance from that sin. But mankind is still, so many are just making bad choices, bad decisions. And they will face judgment for that. One day they will stand before God and give account for every wrongdoing, every sin, every evil that's committed there is a payday um, but God has allowed us to make free choices and we see the evil and the suffering because of that does God intervene absolutely when we pray and we seek God we often see God intervene through these things does God um, reach down and make a difference yes he does when we pray and we intercede we see God make a difference is God with us Yes, we absolutely know that God is with us. And we, we see in Job where there was a hedge about Job and all that he had. So God is with us and he is good. We deal with suffering sometimes. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation helps us to see that we will deal with suffering. But the promise he gave us is that he will be with us, that he will walk with us, that we are never alone, and that one day when we stand in heaven, all the suffering we went through will seem as nothing in comparison to the glory, the goodness of God, and that he will wipe away our tears. He will wipe away all of our suffering, and we will have an eternity to spend in joy, an eternity to have full of love and peace and, and just the glory of God. You know, our, our short life will not seem like a drop in the sand compared to the eternity that we have one day with Christ. So is there, is there suffering in this world? Absolutely. Is there evil? Absolutely. But we have Jesus Christ to go with us through it, and we have a promise that one day it will end when we spend eternity with him. God bless you. I, I hope that this helped you and encouraged you in some way. Um, I, I love you guys, and I, I look forward to seeing you again next week in Sunday School. God bless. <laughs>